Hello, I'm Leroy Garcia, and this is Blue Ring Gallery Podcast. Um, this is a, a post-recording for a pre-recording of an interview with Preston Singletary. These next four episodes that you will be seeing were recorded during Indian Market of 2021. It was an opportunity we had to interview artists as well as collectors, and we hope you will enjoy these. It's a little bit different than what we've been going through as far as just artists. Uh, we want to bring a perspective uh, other than just artists, but also from the collecting front as well. So in this interview with Preston, we've had him discuss his new exhibition that will be opening up at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., the Museum of the American Indian, on uh, January 28th through the 31st. Also, we'd like to let you know we, Blue Rain Gallery, will be uh, doing a pop-up, which is uh, we have rented a space in the Alexandrian Hotel in Alexandria, Virginia, to um, show Preston's work and make it available for sale during the opening of the Smithsonian exhibit. This is a really big deal as Preston is a pioneer and um, has really been an ambassador of glass in the native community. In fact, I would like to say again, uh, if there was no Blue Rain Gallery and no Preston Singletary, there really wouldn't be a native glass art movement like you see today. Um, I would also like to encourage you in, in this episode show notes to um, watch uh, or listen to a podcast that I did with uh, a local podcaster named Brian. His podcast is called Artist with Brian. So scroll down in the notes if you want to learn a little bit more, especially about um, me and the evolution of Blue Ring Gallery and my perspective of artists and clients and the relationship between them. Uh, check out those notes, very important. So hopefully you uh, enjoy this episode. This is uh, with Preston Singletary. It's the title of his exhibit at the Smithsonian is Raven in the Box of Daylight. I hope you enjoy. Today in the studio, we have an honored guest in Preston Singletary. Thank you for coming today, Preston. Thank you. Um, I wanted to interview you for a while, uh, in this format versus the Zoom, uh, because we live so far away, it's hard to do that sometimes. But it is Indian market time, and uh, Preston has produced a one of his best shows ever for Blue Rain Gallery. Um, there's six uh, monumental uh, cast glass totems in this show, amongst maybe 30 other pieces of sculpted glass and baskets and like to encourage everybody to check out our website blueringgallery.com and take a look at his work if you can't make it into our gallery um today though i wanted to uh bring preston in so he can talk a little bit about something special that is happening in his career uh something that he's worked for uh and sacrificed for uh for many years and that uh will culminate in January of this next year, with an opening at the Smithsonian American of or the Museum of the American Indian in Washington D.C., and that exhibit will be uh, going on for about a year or so. And I'd like to encourage people to make a trip out there and and see this special exhibit. Uh, it was well thought out. It was planned for many years in advance, and it turned out beautiful. And with that introduction, um, like Preston to talk a little bit about this show and what it's about and what it took to produce it. <laughs> well, where do we start? Uh, this was definitely a vision I'd had for many years. It was, um, you know, I'd made aspects of the Raven story in sculpture form. You know, the Raven steals the sun, you know, the iconic piece with the little, you know, the red ball. So what's, what's the title of the show? The show is called uh, Raven in the Box of Daylight. It's, uh, it's an exhibition that originated at the Museum of Glass. It traveled to Wichita Art Museum, uh, then now to NMAI. But so uh, this basically explores the whole story and mythology about Raven and how he 
eventually procured the or stole the uh, the sun and the moon and the stars and placed them in the sky and that's how you know that's one of the uh, kind of mythologies that is really well known actually um, and uh, so I chose to try to illustrate it in a, in an exhibition form, which would more be more experiential. So you know, I used elements of, of video, um, and uh, you know, and with the objects telling the story. So as you walk through, you basically get the whole thread of the story. So um, there's a lot of components to it, like the uh, video backdrops that I created with uh, this uh, guy that I designed the exhibition with, Juniper Shui. He was, uh, he comes from the theater background, and so I thought that would be a really good guy to partner up with, and also his skill in working with projected video and sort of video mapping and stuff like that. Um, another component of that is, um, you know, there's a musical, well, there, there's sort of a soundtrack or a soundscape that, you know, is, that follows through the entire thread of the exhibition. Um, so I, I originally, I met this guy in 2004, at the opening of the NMAI, um, in DC, and his name was Walter Porter. And he was a guy who was a Clinkett man, uh, elder from Yakutat. And he had seen my Raven sculpture that I had made. And he says, you know, I, I need to talk to you about this because it's basically my life story or my life's work. And so he... He had uh, done a lot of analysis of Clinkett mythologies and sort of broke them down into symbolism and and kind of, you know, compared it to universal mythologies in the same way that Joseph Campbell did. So he would he would find the symbolism within the stories. And so he shared with me that, uh, you know, his insights to that story. And so from that, I started to, you know, piece together how could you know make this exhibition unfortunately he passed away in like 2015 or something like that so that i ended up finding another curator to work with and she's also clinkett and zuni pueblo and so she's uh you know she's a tenured professor at the university of washington now but i caught her right in this little window where she was able to help me uh you know curate this show and put it all together so <clears throat> tell us a little bit about how you uh how many pieces are in the show? There's, I think there's about 55 pieces in the show. Yep. 55. And um, how long did it take you to, to get this together? Uh, you know, it was a process of about four years, I guess. You know, making pieces slowly and just putting them aside and, and accumulating all the pieces. Um, as time went on, I, I started to think about the story on a deeper level and I, you know, and then I ended up adding more and more. <laughs> I was like, wait, no, there's this aspect of the story is Raven is white, a white bird in the beginning. Kind of and like on the cover of the book, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so then I realized, no, I have to, ha I have to make white ravens. So I made several white ravens as sort of point markers through the uh, exhibition. So it's like he's traveling around, uh, through these in these different areas. So, um, if you could um, describe yourself as a person walking through your exhibit, what's the first thing you're seeing? Tell us about the journey that you created. So, the whole idea was that you know, trying to go create, you know, basically the world and the story. The the world is in darkness. So, you walk into sort of a dark room. And you have uh, you see a clear glass totem, which basically represents the story of Raven. It's got you know a raven. And it's got the the old man and this the daughter sitting on a box where you know containing the sun, moon, and stars. And uh, and then you sort of walk through these little sort of uh, you know thread curtains where you you've got video projection and you see the white raven and so you sort of follow him into this room and so the story basically uh you know there's a lot to the story but basically he goes to these fishermen the fishermen of the night they call them and then uh he's he asks them where's the daylight where's the daylight and um they told him about this old man that is uh has these objects you know this this daylight in his clan house so, so you kind of walk past this river and this canoe and, uh, you know, the video backdrop sort of creating the atmosphere of, of Alaska, the Alaskan coast. Um, and then, then you encounter 
the old man and his daughter, who I learned uh, through talking with different people that strange little detail about the daughter is, is transparent and which, you know, Walter said is it's, it's a, symbolizes supernatural being. And so I made this clear head on a bust that represents the daughter. And then I got the old man. <clears throat> and then so Raven goes to the old man and says, uh, you know, can I come in? I, you know, can I come in and visit? Uh, here you have, you know, the daylight. Mm -hmm. And he, the old man is like, you know, get out of here, you know, shoes him off and won't allow him to come into the clan house. So Raven formulates a plan. He, so the, another section of the of the exhibition uh, is this ladle. And so uh, theoretically, the, the daughter goes out to get um, a drink of water in the morning. So Raven is a transformer and he can you know assume different shapes. So he transforms himself into a speck of dirt and he's floating down this river and she scoops it up. Well, because she's a, a high class family, she has attendants with her and, you know, um, and so they test the purity of the water. So they take a feather and they draw it through the water and they find this dirt. So they, they toss out the water. So there's a, a sculpture with a, a feather and there's a little clear glass droplet. So and a little little speck inside of it. So it's like that symbolizes Raven. So that plan has failed. And so he uh, transforms himself again the next day to um, a hemlock needle. So I've got this mobile that's sort of uh, suspended from the ceiling and it's got these white feathers and white you know elements that are kind of spinning around on these bronze branches. And that's symbolizing the uh, raven transforming into a hemlock needle or you know breaking down his, his you know, and, and tra that transformation process. So I was trying to, at first I was trying to create elements that were like um, animated somehow. Uh, and uh, that was one way. And then the video took it to another level. Um, so at, at, so then she scoops up the water. She doesn't see the hemlock needle. She swallows it. And then she becomes, uh, she realizes instantly that she, she swallowed something and she didn't know, but she became, she became pregnant. And um, which was kind of curious because she wasn't married, you know, so you know, right there is sort of like uh, what Walter would, would say, say, it symbolizes the Immaculate Conception, right? So that's one aspect of it. Um, so, so then I have this, this sort of bust figure with a, you know, a pregnant, you know, belly. And inside I've carved uh, this sort of transformation as sort of a humanoid uh, raven human figure and sitting in this bowl. And so, uh, so she becomes pregnant and very quickly pregnant and she, uh, so uh, they, they comes time to give birth. And in the old days, what they would do is they would, behind the clan house, they would, they would dig this pit and they'd line it with furs. And, uh, and then that's where the baby would be born. And so uh, she's having trouble giving birth. And a medicine woman comes by and says, uh, okay, take the furs out and replace it with, with uh, goat's beard moss. Um, and so in that sort of symbolism, Walter says it's, it's like a, a humble birth, right? He doesn't want to be born on these furs, which is, you know, fancy. yeah, fancy. So this is a humble birth. So um, she finally gives birth to Raven in a, hu in a form of a human child. And so, um, and this child is very precocious and um, mischievous and always, you know, it grew very quickly, this child. And so now you're, you're so in the exhibition, you'll have you're entering into the clan house. Now, that's how the Raven gets into the clan house. So I have this big wall screen and these house posts that uh, that represent, you know, passing through and in, into the interior of the clan house. We have all the treasures that are kept by this old man. And, uh, you know, you have baskets and ladles and rattles and masks and things like this all stacked on this um, shelf which are you know meant to represent the interior you know the stair steps down to the central fire pit within the interior of the clan house um, so there's a lot of objects in there and that's kind of like a the treasure trove or the you know the, the we call it atu, which means um, it's kind of like an heirloom, a family heirloom. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so all of these, this material wealth is there. And then I had these um, 
cedar figures that were cut out, uh, routed out, and then and then I had Dorothy Grant, um, who's Haida, you know, the sister tribe to the Clinket. I had her make these make these garments, and then I put a glass head on the top uh, and a hat. So, you know, I have these standing figures, so it kind of brings some human presence into the, yep. into the space. And um, so then you continue on and then you find these boxes which are illuminated from within. So I have one that has like little star points and then there's one with a, you know, a clear globe and then there's one with a red globe inside. So that, that is, those are the boxes that contain, you know, the, sun, the stars, the moon and the sun. So one by one, you know, he plays with these boxes in the, in the story. And, uh, you know, first it's the box with the stars and when no one's looking, he tosses them up through the smoke hole into the sky and that's how it took their place in the heavens. Um, and so he's reprimanded and he's like, you know, scolded and, you know, they're very disappointed with him and he, uh, the, this, this child. And so he, uh, you know, a few days go by and they kind of forget all about it. So he's playing with this next box, you know, and he's, you know, biding his time and, Finally, he opens up the box, takes out the moon, and he tosses it up into the sky. Um, so this time, he's really in trouble, you know, and the grandfather's really disappointed with him. So he's, uh, uh, Raven sees the, this third box, and he wants to play with it. And he says, ah, no way, you're not, you're not going to get that one. And so the Raven uh, child, he, uh, like, screams and cries and fusses and, you know, just causes a huge you know, scene and he stops eating and he gets really weak. And then the daughter goes to the father and says, um, you know, father, is there anything more important than your, your, your grandson? And he says, okay, I, you know, of course you're right. So he puts the box down and says, uh, but don't, don't open the box. So, um, of course, at this point, Raven's becoming tired of being human in human form. So he, he grabs that box, or he opens up that box and he grabs the son and immediately the, the father knows that uh, he's been fooled. So he grabs onto the tail of Raven who's flapping away and trying to escape. And, uh, and so he, you know, he's struggling with this and he holds the Raven over the fire and the smoke from the fire turns him black. So that's how Raven transformed from white to, from black. White to black. So. Um, and then, uh, so the final act action in the story is like he breaks daylight on the world and everybody is like shocked and like all of a sudden they can see the world around them. And some of them run off into the forest and some jump into the water and some of them jump up into the sky and they become the, the, uh, the animals of those realms. And the people that stood, you know, where they are and uh, either kind of bewildered or couldn't take action, it became the human beings, mm. right? And so uh, over time, and this is a theory that's been discussed, that's like, you know, those uh, animal, um, animal symbols were adopted to uh, represent the families. So, you know, you've got the shark clan and the killer whale and the bear and, and, and it goes on and on. And so um, that's, that's basically, so, so the final, uh, gallery in the exhibition has several busts with heads and hats and the hats have all the, the the symbolism of the different clans from the different realms from the air from the forest from the water and then the human realm so there's and then then you've got this huge video projection that kind of you know gradually gets brighter and brighter and then you have these sort of human figures that was you know we, we kind of borrowed from uh, Juniper's, uh, you know, his dance and theater troupe. So it, it was just really, you know, it was just a really serendipitous thing, you know, as we, we went into the exhibition and we kind of created the video together um, and looked at different options and then he kind of mapped it out and, uh, you know, he just interjected that. I thought that was really cool. Well, it's well thought out. And uh, how, what, what type of uh, space does this take? It's about five, 6,000 square feet. Is about yeah. So, and I think I'm excited about the NMAI uh, installation because the the configuration of the gallery is is really really clever. You're going to be able to actually move to, through different rooms to really uh, experience it. And the the clan house will be 
built with two doors, doorways, passway, passageways that you can walk through it. Is this a, a so you did a screen similar to the one in Anchorage? For this? Yeah. Yeah, the, well, it was in Juno that Juneau. I did, but it was, uh, yeah, it was the original piece I made for the Museum of Glass in 2008, which was my first exhibition I had there. So that was, that's owned by the Museum of Glass. That's the only piece that they, that isn't uh, mine that I made for the exhibition. So, Preston, how, how often do you think it is that a living artist gets an exhibit like this? <laughs> well, you know, I'm pretty, uh, I'm really honored to have been able to pull this off because it's, yeah, I asked myself the same question, right? I mean, I just turned 58 and I'm like, okay. how many, you, you know, know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, uh, it happens to the best of us. Mm -hmm. But I was, I was asked, thinking the same thing, like how many opportunities am I going to have to make, you know, a major exhibition statement like this? It's, uh, it's really challenging, you know, I mean, I, I had a lot of, you know, you mentioned the, the sacrifice um, I mean, I made a lot of work that normally I would have, uh, you know, put into galleries and sold and I had to hold on to it, you know, and it's, you know, it's 50, 50 plus pieces that are um, tied up with the exhibition. Yet, on the other hand, of course, it's a great opportunity to share it with a, a big audience. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're also coming off the uh, Museum of Indian Art and Culture, uh, their glass exhibition of Native Art. And... Um, I, I don't know if they really appreciate um, who you are. And um, it, I would like just to say uh, publicly, you know, uh, Preston is, is a pioneer. He, he's one of the first people uh, of native descent to work in glass. And not only that, uh, he has been an ambassador. And uh, I know Del Chihuly, uh came down here a few times and tried to get glass going, but nobody has had an impact that um, Preston Singletary has, has given this uh, format here in the Southwest Corridor. And we're, we're proud, we're honored. Um, love you, man. <laughs> um, you thanks for coming today. I, I know we could talk for a long time and we're, we're gonna save that for some more uh, interviews in the future. Uh, but thanks for coming, Preston. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'd like to encourage everybody to subscribe to our podcasts on all the platforms you can find from Spotify to iTunes. Uh, or you can just simply go to BlueRainGallery.com uh, under our podcast um, item there and uh, hit it and, and enjoy. Uh, I'd like to also encourage people to come and see our BlueRainPrintShop.com uh, uh, where we have tons of products for everyday life, as you can see. Uh, behind Preston and right here, you can get a lot of his imagery on things that you can use every day. Um, thanks again, Preston. Thank and you. thank everybody for watching. Mm -hmm.